Thank you for downloading from the BBC. For details of our complete range of podcasts and our terms of use, go to bbcworldservice.com slash podcasts. BBC. BBC. You're with the BBC and today it's Health Check. I'm Claudia Hammond. Today on Health Check, we're devoting the whole programme to the extraordinary story of a boy who became immortalised in the scientific literature after a medical accident led his family to bring him up as a girl. When anyone has a baby, the first question everyone asks is, is it a boy or a girl? Biologically, it's sex hormones, physical appearance and the sex chromosomes, XX for a woman, XY for a man, which dictate whether someone is male or female. But what happens if you bring up someone who was a boy as a girl? There was a case just like this in the 1960s, a case which ended in tragedy. It made sense at the time that he became a daughter because we thought, well, maybe it is a matter of Nurture over nature. I tried to put makeup on, but I look like Bozo the Clown. You know, you know, it, it's 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 in you. You know, it's it's in your genetics. It's in your brain. You, you, nobody has to tell you who you are. But that's exactly what they tried to tell a boy, known in the medical literature as John, that he was a girl, a girl known as Joan. In 1997, on the front page of the New York Times, it was reported that an unnamed patient had emerged in his 30s as someone that had been sex-changed as a baby after a botched circumcision. John Colapinto is a journalist. Today he writes for The New Yorker, but in 1997 the John Jones story rang a bell. This person who was being referred to as John Joan to reflect the two lives that he'd lived in was a failed medical experiment and that in his teens he had converted from the girlhood that had been imposed upon him back to being male. And it was explosive because it had always been reported as a success in the medical literature. The New York Times article sprang from an academic paper written by a psychologist who'd finally managed to track down the family who, for more than 25 years, had been held up as proof of an influential theory. The theory that it was upbringing, not biology, that determined whether a person feels they're male or female. But the big revelation was that that wasn't what had happened at all with the case at the heart of the theory. Desperately unhappy with life as a girl, Joan had chosen to revert to being John in his early teens. Colapinto was intrigued. I took a long time to find him. I got friendly with the one psychologist that knew his identity and his location, a man named Dr. Diamond. And we actually corresponded for six months before he gave over the name. I quickly learned that this one isolated and horrifying case actually had implications for the treatment of a lot of different sort of medical genital conditions. When John Colapinto finally met the subject of the famous case study, the result was a 43-page article, The True Story of John Joan. It was to be another three years before the subject agreed to reveal his true identity in the book Colapinto wrote about him. John Joan was in fact David Reimer, a 35-year-old married man who worked in an abattoir. It was not the sort of place where you comfortably said to your co-workers, hey, you know, I was actually raised as a girl and I've reverted to my original sex. And he told his co-workers actually before the book came out. And then it's interesting that he did in the end then talk openly about it on TV from having been so reticent at the first place. I have to say that was amazing to watch. I think one of the empowering things for David was for him to learn that people were not prone to ridicule him or laugh at him or think he was peculiar. They certainly had when he was a child as a girl. So he was used to ridicule and he feared it. Even David wasn't his original name, just the one he chose when he reverted to being male. On the 22nd of August 1965 in Winnipeg in Canada, Janet Reimer, still a teenager like her husband, gave birth to identical twin boys, Bruce and Brian. The young parents were thrilled and everything went well for the first seven months. But then, as Janet Reimer told the BBC Horizon programme... Bruce and Brian both started having trouble uh, urinating. The doctors suggested circumcision... 
So on the 27th of April 1966, the Rymers left their baby sons at the hospital to be circumcised. The next morning, there was a phone call. The penis has been burnt off from circumcision. And I could not comprehend what he was talking about because, you see, I thought they were going to use a knife. I didn't know there was electricity involved. Using a cauterizing needle instead of a blade, the electrical equipment had malfunctioned and the surging current had completely burnt off Bruce's penis. Brian's operation was cancelled and the Rymers took their twins home. Daily I was crying. Every time I changed his diaper, I'd cry. I was in shock. I guess about a year I was in shock. The Rymers had no idea where to turn for help, until one evening when they set eyes on a man who was to change their lives and the lives of their twins forever, Dr John Money. We just happened to be watching TV. And Dr. Money was on there, and he was very charismatic. He seemed very highly intelligent and very confident of what he was saying. John Money was a psychologist specialising in sex changes and had recently helped found the Gender Identity Clinic at Johns Hopkins University Medical Centre in Baltimore in the USA. He believed that it wasn't so much biology that determines whether we're male or female, but how we're raised – so it was possible for a baby who was genetically male but had been born with underdeveloped genitals to be raised successfully as a girl. Similarly, a girl born with both male and female sexual organs could be brought up to believe she was male. Such conditions were termed hermaphrodite or later intersex. Today they're called disorders of sex development. Money questioned the gender stereotypes that called for the absolute in femininity or masculinity and he spoke to the BBC in 1974. We have a balance of the masculine and the feminine principle in all men and in all women. We can only try by empirical trial and error to discover what are the variations of the feminine pattern of behaviour and what are the variations of the masculine pattern that are completely viable and acceptable in themselves even though they are not part of the historical stereotype that we've been growing up to be accustomed to. It makes it very exciting, don't you think, to live in an age of, of discovery of human personality this way. In the middle of the century, the predominant theory for how to handle intersex was based on research dating back to the 1870s. Heino Meyer Balberg is professor of psychology and psychiatry at Columbia University in New York. In the 1950s, if a baby's sex was ambiguous at birth, the practice was to consider them female if they had ovaries and male if they had testicles. Money's great achievement at that time was to demonstrate that holding on to these biological indicators as a determinant of sex assignment was plain wrong because there were too many exceptions that didn't fit the rule. And that uh, was a real revolution when he formulated this new policy that the assignment should be not on the basis of biological indicators, but on a complex assessment of what the most likely optimal outcome, given what we knew at that time about biology and social learning and feedback from later outcomes of such syndromes was. In the TV programme that the Rymers saw, Money had brought with him a male-to-female transsexual, as evidence that the sexual equipment a baby's born with doesn't necessarily determine whether it's male or female. The transsexual certainly made an impact because she was a very feminine-seeming woman. And I thought, here's our answer. Janet wrote to John Money, and within a few weeks she'd taken Bruce to see him in Baltimore. For Money, the case provided the ideal experiment. Here was a child whom he believed should be brought up as the opposite sex, who even brought his own control group with him, an identical twin. It was perfect. One twin could be brought up as a girl and one as a boy. And if it worked, this would provide irrefutable evidence that nurture could override biology. And Money genuinely believed that Bruce had a better chance of living a happy life as a woman than as a man without a penis.